with regard to this animal called the cost of living, we told these people several times, you are in the hole. Don't continue to dig. That is actually the remedy all the time. Don't dig when you're in the hole. But they don't understand. You saw how our members of parliament fought very hard in parliament against this new tax, tax bill, which eventually became now the tax law and act. Because we're saying that increasing taxes is not the solution to the problem we're having. You, if you increase the, the taxes, there's always a tendency of, to evade. People will evade taxes. People, for example, are not paying. You've increased the tax on fuel. Many people are not driving. They, you don't have that jam on the street the way you used to have it. People are pulling to come to work. As a matter of fact, the consumption of fuel last month went down by nearly 15%. So the revenue that you want to get by increasing the taxes is not there. Okay? But then we told them, we are here, we've already we've been here before. When we came into government for the first time in 2002, we found a collapsing economy. The economy was very, very poor. The Paris Club, the members of the donor community, had stopped giving Moy the money that they used to give him. So the theft and the collection was very low. It was only collecting 200 billion shillings. And the growth of, uh, rate was actually minus. So it was negative. But then we looked at the, the status of the economy generally. And we realized where the problem was. First, we realized, we looked at the revenue side and the expenditure side. That is very simple economics. Where the money is coming from and how the money is being spent. That is where there's a problem. The revenue boys Income, the income tax, VAT, customs, boys, then procurement officers in the ministries. Those are the boys in town. They're the ones who are buying apartment blocks in town. They're the ones who are buy, driving the latest models of cars, Mercedes, Toyota, and so on. They're the ones who are building castles in rural areas. They're the ones who are building high-rise buildings in village markets. So if you do lifestyle audits, you catch them very easily. And we did lifestyle audit, and we caught so many of them. Some of them we sacked, some of them we took to, took to jail and hired new people. We came into government in, 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 in January between January and uh, February and, and, and June that year, the revenue went up by 100 billion shillings. So we were collecting now 300 billion instead of 200 billion, which had been collected the previous year. The following year, it went to 500 billion. 750, it reached 1 trillion shillings. Without increasing taxes, just plugging the holes where it was leaking, we increased revenue. We reached a stage where we were able to finance all our requirement, all the development projects. To 95% was being financed from domestic revenue. Only 5% was coming from out of the country. Yeah? Uh, neither. Then on procurement side, we found under the Moy system there was a, a procurement rule that said that any 
procurement above 100,000 shillings in value must be done competitively. You must advertise in at least three newspapers. There must be at least three bidders. And you, 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 you procure competitively. You go for the, the, the lowest bidder. We found that, because in each and every ministry, there was a procurement officer seconded from the treasury who was in charge. We found that each and every procurement officer had three companies registered. And there was the kind of collusion the one in, in health is supplying education. The one in education is supplying trade and commerce. The one there is supplying agriculture. The one in agriculture is supplying health and so on and so forth. So if there's a tender, you'll get three bids, all of them from actually one person. And the prices were inflated. An item which is supposed to be bought at 100,000 shillings is bought at 5 million shillings. And that's where the, 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 the government was losing money. The government was leaking. So, uh, once we subjected all these procurement officers to, to a lifestyle audit and sacked some of them, because the government was now procuring competitively. The prices became less, so the government was able to get more, and that is how we succeeded. You see that the government of Kibaki has succeeded. It succeeded because of what we did. Right now, first the civil service is demoralized. They are bringing people from outside the civil service, being made permanent secretaries. Somebody who has never even been to Kabete to be trained in administration does not know how civil service is working. It's being recruited and made in there. It's just so and so, so long as it's from my tribe. From my tribe. These things are not going to get better because these people are actually messing up. They don't know how to run a competitive economy. They will not, things will not change. And you cannot be one person who is a president. You are the permanent secretary in all ministries. You are the minister in all ministries. Huh? You know everything. Even if a Lino is coming, you don't know the, the, the Lino is not coming. <laughs> the work which should be done by director of metrology is being done by you as a president. Everything, you must be talking about on everything. Even if it's a, somebody's wife the Nini did, did not uh, dress properly. The one who know. So, so uh, this is where we have a problem, and th th so these people, they don't know that they don't know, and we are not ready to advise them, because they know everything. Okay, because they know everything. So you people have a responsibility to sensitize the people. So now, chance is no longer the cheapest. A vacuum is building down there, which Kenya can actually fill with proper policies. But you cannot do it if you've got mediocrity and the kind of rogues and thieves running our affairs. These thieves will take us nowhere. The cost of living which Jimmy is talking about here, will not go down when these thieves are, are, are in charge. This cost of living will not go down. You see, today, people are suffering all over. If those who are saying that demonstrations by Azimio in Haribu Biashara Yetu, they were not going to Baba, you up. Now, Baba Akokimia is not talking. <laughs> eh? Because they say that all oh, demonstrations are, are, are destroying our businesses. No, their businesses are being destroyed not by demonstrations, but through taxation. 
taxation sasa mbona umbo na kula watoto yake si umbo na kula watoto yake eh sasa wasema ati mkuki kwa nguruwe kwa binadamu ni uchungu eh so sisi we are here manake alisema wao ni wanajua pili watafanya at this day ni lichukuliwa mingi all, all this time all rubbish now they were saying that the cost of fuel i showed babu yesterday a gazette in the tanzanian newspaper showing how they're reducing the cost of fuel of petrol or diesel of uh, uh, paraffin and they're saying that because of the war in uh, the middle east Israel and uh, and Palestine, the cost of fuel has gone down. Here, Ms. Shirishiri is telling you because of that war, the cost of fuel has gone up. Yet the source where Tanzania is buying is the same source where Kenya is also buying. Who is who is fooling who? Eh? So you see, the, the 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 reason why the cost of fuel is up is very different. They killed what is called OTS, where there used to be an open tender system where all the oil companies will come and bid to supply the fuel. And when uh, uh, the tender has been opened, the cheapest is awarded and goes and brings it. They came up with what they're calling G2G, that themselves are now buying directly from uh, uh, Abu Dhabi and from Saudi Arabia. But they themselves are the ones who are making the commissions. That's why the cost of fuel is going up. That money is actually ending up in the pockets of the same same people here. Umbwa inakula watoto yaki. Thank you so much and I feel very delighted to have an opportunity to meet with you this morning. I was somehow ambushed but I said, yes, I'm ready to meet them and see them, their faces. So I've heard so many things that you guys have talked about. I noted the issue of funding of the education in the country, the funding model, the disbursement. You talked of the cost of living. You talked of mental health in the university, which is now acute. You talked about uh, police brutality, academic freedom. Then you also talked about uh, the electoral process, universal uh, suffrage. You talked about um, uh, the, girl, the girl student. Uh, and the problems that they face. You talked about insecurity in the institutions. Then you talked about involvement in decision making. Uh, and uh, of course the funding model and so on. And uh, yeah, then generally the fear, the fear that you talked about. You see it is Shakespeare who said in the Julius Caesar that I don't know why you should fear, fear death that death is a necessary evil that will come when it will come that cowards die so many times before their death but the brave don't taste of death but once but another friend of mine said, you should never fear at all. If you are sick, you should not fear. Because you'll either be treated and you, you'll recover, or you will die. <laughs> if you recover, you don't need to fear anything. But even if you die, you don't need to fear. Because when you go up there, you will either go to heaven 
will go to hell. When you go to heaven, you have nothing to fear. <laughs> but when you, you, you go to hell, also you have nothing to fear. You meet so many of your comrades. <laughs> so you'll spend a lot of time just greeting them, saying, how are you doing? <laughs> Before your time comes to go to fire. <laughs> so don't fear. <laughs> you don't need to fear anything. <laughs> okay? So, um, but uh, um, Jim has told you, uh, you know, where we are coming from. I myself was a student leader in Europe. We used to have what was called Federation of Kenyan Students in Europe. And I was the Secretary General who organized all Kenyan students from Ireland all the way to the Urals, that means uh, Soviet Union in those days. And we used to meet and organize ourselves and actually make contributions that assisted the people who are struggling back here at home. We are members of the International Students' Union, which Jim has just, just referred to, which is based in Prague. At that time, the leader was from Angola, a member of what they call MPLA, which is now the ruling party in Angola at that time. And this student movement actually assisted the liberation movement back at home. In those days, Zim uh, Zimbabwe was still called Rhodesia, uh, uh, struggling. Mozambique, Angola, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Kavad were still under the Portuguese colonialism. South Africa, Apartheid was ruling supreme in South Africa. Then the student movement those days actually fought and assisted the freedom fighters. We also organized scholarships for young people who were there in the bush to come to Europe and get education at that time. Now, um, when we came back here, the uh, university of, of, uh, students in Nairobi were very, very fundamental in supporting the movement for change in the country. And they suffered for that. Jim here was a, the student leader when I was myself a member of the academic staff at the University of Nairobi. They used to be arrested you see that the central police station is just next door there. Uh, and then there was uh, Amzungu, what was the name of that Amzungu? Who was the Nairobi area. Uh, was, uh, but then there was another one called Patrick Shaw, who was <laughs> very not notorious. <laughs> he came down there to beat up the students. But they stood very, very firm. They quite a number of them who were arrested, some of them were expelled. Him, after him, the late Oki Mbaka, eh? before that there was a, a worry, a worry Wakataka, uh, and then there were several so, so other student leaders who were actually arrested or expelled from the, the university at that time. That is a time when uh, the erosion of academic freedom had, had started in our institutions. And this, this has continued to, the, this struggle for freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of speech, but academic freedom at the university has been very much part and parcel of the struggle for democratization in our country in general. And you see that there is always attempt to try to muzzle the student voice. It's no doubt that this amendment was moved by 
one who is now the Minister for Defense, to deprive the students with the right to elect the leaders of choice uh, by bringing the so-called delegate system. I see. Uh, but as Bob was told you, this matter is coming back to Parliament. And, uh, uh, and our instruction to our members is to ensure that you go back to universal franchise. <laughs> one man, one vote. One man, one vote, one shilling. <laughs> okay? We will work to see that this happens. Then, you know, the, this issue of funding model which they have brought here, it's very confusing. It is not quite clear. Because they're talking about those without any, any means who will get 100% support, those with some little bit of, of, of um, ability or support, and then those who don't require support at all. And you ask yourself, where is the barometer? Are you going to test the, the, the temperature? You will see that so and so parents are employed, but that fellow who is employed is actually supporting 10 students or children. Somebody is probably earning less down here, but he's only supporting one, one, one student. This student went to a national school. Then it's assumed that the student uh, has got means. How do you know? Going to a national school is just because of the marks that you received at the examination. And maybe your uncle can offer to sponsor you. Or just a friend with the family can offer to sponsor you because you've done well. That does not mean that this fellow is going to sponsor you at the university. So all of these things they are, they're coming about with are things which are not been tested. They are basically like people who are walking in the dark. Uh, uh, and then um, the, the issue of using police in the institutions of learning is again something that we have condemned very strongly. That universities should be allowed to do their things and the police should not be used excessively in the universities. Students should be able to engage and dialogue with the university authorities. That is the simplest way of running universities. But we are dealing with a state that has gone rogue too early, too early. And that is where we are having these uh, problems. Now, we uh, set down ourselves as members of Azimio and looked at education in a country. Because education is what actually <coughs> differentiates societies. You find a country like Japan does not have any kind of uh, natural resources of any of, of, uh, of repute. Japan does not have minerals, does not have gold, does not have oil, does not have uranium, and so on and so forth. But Japan is number three in the world in terms of uh, economic development. How? Basically because of the quality of education of the Japanese people. That is what has put Japan where it is. They use their brains to create wealth. And this is what has been lacking on the African continent. Because Africa is the richest continent on the planet Earth in terms of 
natural resources. The paradox is that the richest in resources is also the poorest. That the living conditions in Africa is far much below the other countries which do not have as much resources as Africa has. And that is what he said we wanted to correct. And it can't be corrected. But it can only be corrected by empowering the African people. Right from the African child going up. And here you must talk about the girl child and the boy child. Give them equal opportunity to be able to realize their natural talents. This is why we said that we want to start by creating free primary, secondary, and even university education. And then, because then you have empowered the people. But you also talk about the quality of education. What kind of education are you giving these people? See, today we have a problem here. Where you have got universities all over. When we were here, when Jim was first uh, student here, they are some of the first students to join University of Nairobi. It used to be University College of Nairobi. I was employed by University College of Nairobi which was a constituent college of the University of East Africa, whose headquarters were in Makarere, in Kampala. So Nairobi was a campus, Dar es Salaam was a campus, and Makarere a campus at that time. Then, of course, uh, uh, eventually we got University of Nairobi. Then now, eventually, we started Kenyatta College, we used to call it Kenko. It also became a university. Then the proliferation of universities now all over the country. We now have, I don't know how many public universities. How many? Huh? 72 universities in the country. But what is important is the quality of education which is coming out of these universities. It's important. And this should be looked at in terms of demand for skills in the country. So that education is relevant to the demand on the market in our country. You see, you see, you find a situation here where you've got many companies around looking for people to employ. And then you have got many people with certificates from universities looking for employment. But they are not employable here. The, the, the jobs which are available are not commensurate with the qualifications of those who are demanding the jobs. So we need to find a way in which we can match the demand of society with what is being trained in our high in our, our schools of learning, in universities, so that we, there is no gap. Some people have papers, but these papers are not useful to them. So we need to make it relevant. I've been telling people that, look, how does did China manage to come from a poor third world economy to number two in the world, threatening the United States. In the next 10 years, China is going to be the biggest uh, economy in the world. How did they do it? They did it by first, first making uni uh, education universal and ensuring that they give people relevant qualifications, the people, highly skilled. So when they liberalized and they found the companies from the West who were looking for destinations where there's cheap labor, they went to China. And there they found 
highly skilled cheap labor in China. And that is why they went and, 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 and made China. China became the workshop of the world. You go and find Samsung is manufactured in China. Daewoo is manufactured in China. Mercedes, Benz, Volvo, Peugeot, Toyota, Ford, all manufactured in China. But I used to work in the Mercedes company factory in a place called Tuttgart. They told me that it is cheaper to manufacture Mercedes now in China, ship it back to Germany, than the one which is manufactured in Germany. So China became the factory of the world. Now China has been able to build the biggest middle class, 500 million people, middle class. Chinese middle class is bigger than the entire population of the United States. Here it double. 